Well, it looks like I am going to start letting everybody in. If we are ready to go. Good. Everybody okay. have fun. All right. Good luck, everybody. Okay, I'll let everybody get settled. Okay. All right, thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Natalie Luna Rose and I'm the Outreach and Communications Manager for the Arizona Center for Disability Law, also a partner with the Arizona Developmental Disabilities Network. Um, and today our topic is an unexpected journey, my story through a person-centered lens. But before I head it off to Lori, I will, with AFSCME, I'm going to go through a few guidelines. Um, the Zoom guidelines. Uh, I know a lot of us have been on Zoom probably for the last almost two years now, but it's always good to have a refresher and it's been a moment. Uh, so we just ask, assume good faith from your colleagues. We are all here to learn together. Recognize and respect others' feelings, backgrounds, cultural differences. Please use the chat or raise hand function if you wish to share verbally. If you are speaking, please speak slowly for our ASL and closed captioner. And try to limit yourself to 30 seconds or less. It can be just as courageous to listen as it is to share. And we've got a little Diagram down here at the bottom, if you're unaware, but it's down at the bottom where you see reactions, you bring your uh, cursor down if you want to um, engage. And last thing um, in the chat, if you would like to put uh, your name and where you're from, you don't have to, but kind of like to keep track of who's joining us today. So I am going to now pass this off to Lori. Lori, it's all yours. Oops. Thank you, Natalie. So great to be here. And I appreciate you that you're reminding of us all how to be our best selves as we engage in today's webinar. And hello, everyone. Thank you much so much for joining us. I'm Lori Sandinay. I'm Chief Operations Officer for the Women's Foundation for the State of Arizona. But I'm also a consultant implementing provider transformation and coaching to help an organization transition their 14C minimum wage program to a competitive integrated employment model here in Arizona. Prior to my two current positions, I was with the Sonoran USED directing a pre-employment transition services program that focuses on work-based learning experiences for students with disabilities. I'm also a certified work incentives counselor, a CWIC, a certified employment support professional, a CESP, and a person-centered plan facilitator and Arizona APSI board co-president. I've developed a successful employment program within a behavioral health organization, supporting people with developmental disabilities, mental illness, and substance use disorders to obtain and maintain meaningful integrated employment. I've had the pleasure and privilege to know today's presenter, David Mirahashi, from my work in urban and rural counties in Eastern Washington State, which included serving the Spokane Tribe of Indians and the Colville Confederated Reservations. While working in Washington, five job specialists became certified employment support professionals and four became person-centered plan facilitators while I supervised them. I love to train and share my knowledge of supported employment with state agencies, providers, schools, families, employers, and quite frankly, anyone who will listen to me. But lastly, I consider myself a champion for competitive integrated employment and employment first, and look forward to moving ahead with employment first in Arizona. According to the PACERS National Parent Center on Transition and Employment, a person-centered plan can help those involved with the individual see the total person. It focuses on their desires and interests and discovers completely new ways of thinking about the future for that person. Furthermore, PCP or person-centered plans is an ongoing problem-solving process used to help people with disabilities plan for their future. In person-centered planning, groups of people focus on a certain individual and that person's vision of what they would like to do in the future. 
This person-centered plan team meets to identify opportunities for, for that individual to develop personal relations, participate in their community, increase control over their own lives, and develop the skills and abilities needed to achieve these goals. Person-centered planning depends on the commitment of a team of individuals who care about that person. These individuals take action to make sure that the strategies discussed in planning meetings are implemented. So what is the purpose? The purpose is to look at an individual in a different way, to assist a focused person in gaining control over their own life, to increase opportunities for participation in the community, to recognize individual desires, interests, and dreams, and through effort, a plan turns dreams into reality. Who is involved in a person-centered plan? The individual and whoever they would like to be involved. It's the best when there's a facilitator and a person to record what is being shared. The facilitator should be a person that is neutral and unbiased and leads the process, handles conflict, and assures equal opportunity for all to participate. Others that may be included are parents or guardians, other family members, friends, professionals, and anyone else who has personal interest in the individual. I think these should also include people's DDD case managers, their VR counselors, everyone who wants them to be successful. Where is person-centered planning done? At the focus of the person's home or somewhere comfortable, informal, unhospitable. Um, it should be in a place that the person feels most comfortable. And when should the person-centered planning take place? At any time in a person's life. However, it is best done before transition services are determined. A person-centered plan can be very useful to developing a transition plan. And whatever that transition may be, school to work, school to independent living, whatever transition, a person-centered plan can be very useful. Now that we know how traditional person-centered planning is done, we're going to hear from our guest, David, who has modified person-centered planning. He, before we do, let me give you some background on David. David Murahashi is an independent special education trainer and consultant. His career began as a job coach through the Washington Initiative for Supported Employment, or WISE, where he found that he really enjoyed working with transition age youth in the classroom and at job sites. In 2012, he graduated from Seattle Pacific University with a degree in special education. David has been working in the disability field since 2009, but two important things have helped shape him. First, he has an older sister with Down syndrome who currently lives and works in the community and has taught him about what is possible. Second, he is a stroke survivor, which has given him unique insights into the world of disabilities. Despite the health setbacks, David has helped develop several programs designed to assist with people with disabilities and their families to start planning at a younger age and to prepare them for, the, for future employment and life in the community. These programs have been implemented in several counties in Washington and Oregon. David currently is a person-centered planner who loves to help individuals find their voice and help them make their hopes and dreams a reality. He serves on the board of Washington APSI and Trillium Employment Services. He is also currently a technical assistance training manager at Washington Initiative for Supported Employment or WISE. David has a strong belief that with the right support, all people have the skills, abilities, and right to live, learn, work, and play in their community. We will have a question and answer session after David's presentation. We also ask that you complete the webinar survey that will be put into the chat. A link will be put into the chat. And we sincerely appreciate your honest feedback. Now, let's hear from David. I'm so thrilled to have you, David. Welcome. Thank your you. time. I'm going to share my screen. Just make sure everyone can see that. Um, well, welcome, um, everyone, to an unexpected. Am I? Have to move all the Zoom things around. Okay. <laughs> um, welcome to everyone to an unexpected journey. Uh, my story through a person-centered planning lens. Um, this is a picture of me um, wearing a um, helmet looking out at Elliott Bay from Harborview Medical Center in Seattle, Washington. Um, I'm gonna kind of let you ponder kind of what that picture is about, but um, um, let me 
yeah, so sorry, the zoom things you need to move. Okay. So again, my name is David Rahashi. Um, I'm a tall biracial Japanese and Caucasian man with um, short dark brown hair and I am I'm wearing glasses and a blue polo shirt. Um, for the past eight years, I've been involved, um, I've been an independent special ed trainer and consultant and has helped develop programs and um, material around um, community employment. And I am also a person-centered planning facilitator and someone who has received a person-centered plan for myself. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. Um, I'll be sharing stories um, from my life and how my life ex experiences have helped shape my perspectives and um, the way I see and do person-centered planning. So um, the first thing I'm gonna be talking about is my um, first story is um, the wisdom of a bald man. So I grew up in Bellevue, Washington, which is just east of Seattle. And I have two older sisters who both have disabilities. My older sister, Laura, has um, type 1 diabetes, which, um, while my other sister, Holly, has um, Down syndrome. Um, because of this, my family has been involved and connected with the broader disability community. So I've always been around people with disabilities and never thought it was weird. Um, my sisters were always my sisters. Um, this is a picture of me and my sisters. Um, um, we are in a field of tulips and we're wearing jackets and stuff, so. Um, so this is a picture of me in college um, and I'm wearing a purple um, hoodie and I'm kind of pointing from posing for the camera. So I entered college not really knowing what I was uh, wanted to do. I'm, in fact, I started off um, studying biology. I did take a course, um, a career path class to try and kind of figure out what I wanted to do. In this class, I had to um, take the Myers-Briggs um, personality test and found out that a lot of people with my personality were teachers. Um, but I was a very shy person with a fear of public speaking. So teaching didn't seem like a good fit for me. So this class didn't help me uh, much. You know, the class just let me think through things but um, about myself, but didn't let me talk things um, out with other people. In the meantime, I got my first job as a job coach, which with Washington Initiative for Supportive Employment, WISE. Um, and I loved it. I got to work with students um, in their job sites and um, community in the community and in the um, classroom. I got to work and learn from um, special ed and um, transition teachers. Um, when I saw my students excelling, I felt like I was excelling. Um, but still, at the end of my first year of college, I had finished um, basic biology classes and was signed up for more in the fall. But during the summer, I worked with the Lake Washington's um, transition program and I got to know the teachers, Richard Haynes and Mr. T. So I really had some good conversations with them about teaching. They saw how well I was working with the students and it was Richard that told me, you know, I think you would be good at this. I really took those conversations to heart. Their encouragement and their belief in me kind of helped me see past my anxieties. So a week before um, starting for fall quarter, I changed my major to special education with the hopes of becoming a transition teacher. Um, this is a picture of me and Richard. I, my favorite bald wise guy. Um, he is a tall, white, 
older man with um, glasses and is, um, and we're, um, and he has a very shiny bald head. So um, looking back at the time, I was, I wish I could have had a person center plan when I was struggling to kind of figure out what I wanted to do. It was nice that my school had a class that to help you think about possible futures, but these tests really didn't help. What took was Richard and Mr. T seeing my strengths, my um, potential and really speaking to my heart to help me see who I was. So when someone is trying to figure out who to invite to their um, Prison Center plan, tell them you want people that know them, like them, care about them, and will want to help them succeed and reach their goals. You want those people that can see things in you that you might not see in yourself. So my next story is an unexpected journey. So in 2012, I started my full-time student teaching at a high school in Seattle. I really had a sweet gig there because I had already job coached many of the students and, um, and they know, knew me. Um, this is a picture of me and my um, mentor teacher and, and with our class. Um, when I was starting my second week of full-time student teaching, I was feeling on top of the world. My first week had gone well and I was excited to start that next week. And the day always started with a PE class. The first thing we did was kind of walked around the gym and um, you know, to kind of warm up. And I was walking with the students um, with high um, energy when I felt a pop in my head that was followed by the worst pain I have ever felt. I honestly thought I was shot in the head, but there was no blood. I it stood there for a minute, kind of hoping it would go away, but it didn't take very long to realize that something was terribly wrong. Um, I walked over to the para and told him um, that I had a bad headache and I think I needed to go see the nurse. And he's told me, you know, no problem. And so I slowly left the gym, walked down a flight of stairs and all the way down to the nurse's office um, with each step getting harder to keep my balance. Somehow I made it to the to our office and told her the same thing. I had a bad headache. So she had me um, sit down and lie down onto the couch that was there. And I covered my eyes and that's basically what I could remember. I, I don't remember much after that. I vaguely remember uh, my mentor teacher talking in the background. And then the last thing I really remember was being carted into a ambulance. The next clear memory I had was six days later, I was lying in a um, bed at Harborview Medical Center, um, slowly waking up from a coma. My dad was there and was really excited because um, the Seahawks had just beat the Patriots. Um, I had somehow survived a major stroke caused by um, a rare condition called an AVM. Um, so I have two pictures up here. The First is a um, drawing of me unconscious at the hospital. Um, there's lots of equipment hooked up to me. And this other picture is um, a picture that my nurse drew. She saw me as a samurai warrior um, armed, and, uh, armed up and battling for my life. In an instant, my life had been changed forever as I lay in the hospital bed, no one um, knew what the, the after effects of the was gonna be. And all they knew at that time was 20% of my skull had been removed to re leave pressure on my um, brain. I was having trouble seeing. My speech was scrambled. 
oh, and I still had this rare condition that caused all this mayhem and would need future surgeries and procedures to deal with it. I went from having a clear vision of my future to wondering if I would be alive the next day. Spoiler alert, I, I'm still alive. I'm here to talk with you guys. So. Uh, my next story is the new normal. So right after my stroke, I had a ton of support from my friends and family. You know, my friends from school would come and visit me at the hospital and then uh, at my parents' house where I was staying. Um, this picture is me um, wearing a helmet with my roommate who is a Caucasian man with a beard and is giving me a big hug. Um, during the first year of my recovery, I was in and out of the hospital a lot. But besides the constant headaches and, the, and having to wear a helmet to protect my um, swollen brain, physically I was able to recover pretty fast. But my speech was devastated and my reading was completely wiped out um, by the stroke. And I was facing years of speech therapy with no guarantees of um, full recovery. Along my, um, along with my speech, my reading, um, in my reading, I had lost my vision, part, part of my vision. Um, because of that, I was no longer able to drive. So I no longer had an easy way to um, stay connected with my friends. Um, so suddenly 15, 10, five miles felt like a world away. But when my when people realized I wasn't coming back to school or getting better anytime soon, I heard less and less from them, and they kind of moved on with their lives. You know, I remember seeing people the day before my stroke, not realizing that would be the last time I ever saw them. Um, so my friends list shrunk pretty fast, and isolation became my new normal, normal um, that I still struggle with today. Um, the image on the screen is Thanos from the Marvel films, um, snapping his finger and making the um, group of stick figure people disappear. Oh. Um, and there's one person left. I do want to say that I do have some um, dear friends that, um, and colleagues that have stuck with me and I will cherish their friendships forever. But this isolation, this disconnection, this life that um, depended on others to say, stay connected, how many people with disabilities do you know whose lives are like that? Unfortunately, this is a normal for a lot of people. Um, when I do person center plans, I always think about the person's whole life and their connections. You know, this is a picture of a circle of support that has different groups uh, that kind of make up a circles, uh, the make up the circles of friends, families, helpers, neighbors, or um, coworkers, or um, schoolmates. You know, what does their circle of support look like for you or for people, for a person you are working with? Is it a circle that is um, where every section is full? Or are some sections not full, so it looks like a flat tire? Um, if they have a flat tire, is it, it is important to spend some time and help them um, strategize on how they can make their circle full and robust? How can they stay connected with people? Some of the best ways to make friends is to um, find common interests. Um, this can also help with finding jobs matches. You know, really spend some time and dig deep into 
what the person's likes and interests are. Then ex explore where they can find their um, these things in their community. There are plenty of activities and clubs out there um, based on interest and are a good way to start making friends. You know, I think what the pandemic has shown us is how terrible isolation is. As we move forward and get back to a more normal life, um, remember these people who were and are isolated and how we can support them uh, moving forward. So the next story is the power of words. So this is a picture of me and my um, Holly when we were little and um, we're in swim clothing with a golden retriever down in the grass. You know, when we were younger, I was at a beach with Holly. She was enjoying herself in the water when two little kids jumped in and started splashing each other and everyone around them. And Holly was not amused by that and told them to stop splashing her. And the kids kind of stopped, looked at her, and one of them said, shut up and called her the R word. My sister started crying. I could see how upset she was, but you know, I couldn't truly know what she was feeling. That was until I was hanging out with one of my friends um, at, at the time, only a few months after my stroke. That day I was struggling with aphasia. And if you don't know what aphasia is, um, think about this. Imagine a deck of cards um, with each card having words and pictures, and then someone coming in, cutting the words from the pictures, and then shuffling the deck. Aphasia feels like the struggle to re um, put your putting the words back to, with the pictures, and um, and it's that struggle to be able to speak what you what you're thinking about. Um, anyways, I was having a hard time getting my words out on that day. And that is when my friend thought it would be funny to call me the yard word. Um, that is when I learned how devastating that word can be and what my sister was feeling that day at the beach. You know, it meant I was no longer an equal. I was below him. I was no, not defined by what I couldn't to, I was being defined by what I couldn't do, what I, um, what I couldn't control. I was being defined by my disability. But the thing is, we don't define people who don't have disabilities the same way. And you know, we talk about people's strengths and abil and gifts. You know, my parents are both singers who have um, sung in choirs and, and they lead worship at our church. Um, then there was me who always had trouble singing on key. You know, singing was never my strength. Um, however, I learned that I could always keep us um, beat during kind of their practices at church. Um, um, I would follow along with their the drummer there and even though I had no lessons, but when the, um, drummer left and I, I started just messing around on the drums and people realized that I could um, I could keep a steady beat and before long I became their drummer. You know, my gift wasn't singing. My gift was drumming. Um, and this is a picture of me um, playing the drums at my church. But the thing is when I couldn't sing, no one ever said that I had a singing disability. They would say, you know, maybe, you know, keep your day job, but for people with disabilities, we tend to focus on what they can't do and not focus on what they can do. So what does that mean when we are teachers or job coaches, employers or facilitators? You know, are we defining people by their disabilities or are we defining them? 
by their abilities. But the deal is that for people with disabilities, we do all sorts of evaluation tests and uh, assessments that and tell, that tells us all the things you can't do. And I had to go through a lot of those after my stroke and it doesn't feel good. And it is a gut punch to you know, your self-esteem. And then we do it over and over again and wonder why they are not succeeding. But that's why I love person-centered planning because they put people's strengths, skills, and abilities in the spotlight. Now we build a plan on what you can do. We ask them what they are good at and discover what makes them amazing. And then we figure out you know, plans where they can use their gifts and their and can and contribute, how they can contribute, um, then we can put the right supports around them so that they can be successful. Um, this is a picture of a spotlight in, and it's shining at a superhero wearing a red cape. When you are someone or, or a family member who um, only hears negative things about you, being shown all these things that you can do can be life-changing. My next story is why doing things that matter matters. Um, in the fall of 2013, I was in speech therapy I'm slowly relearning how to read and how to um, handle my aphasia. You know, I had just gotten my first gamma knife um, procedure to treat my AVM. Um, this is a picture of me um, um, with my um, head wrapped in a um, bondage after uh, one of my treatments. But unfortunately, I, right after this, I had a second brain bleed. So my recovery was really going up and down. However, about a month later, I got a phone call from uh, Marsha Threadkill, who was with WISE at the time, and she had a big question for me. She had an idea for a program for families with young individuals with um, disabilities that would help them navigate the system and provide uh, and pr prepare them um, for transition and future work in the community. This program would eventually be called Start Now. And she wanted to know if I wanted to design, write, and teach the curriculum. So with all that was going on, I was very hesitant to do this. I, it, it had only been a month since I had been in the hospital. I hadn't worked for over a year and I was still sleeping 12 to 15 hours a day. Could I actually um, handle all that work? And the truth was, no, I didn't think I could. You know, besides all my health problems, I was just a 22 year old with no um, kids or very basic understanding of the complex system. You know, how could I be able to teach parents? So I shared my concerns with WISE, but they were pretty persistent. They um, Then they said, how about we hire you to run the student track and we'll find someone else to teach the um, parents? And I was still concerned with um, my health and it could if I could handle it but the um, but I made the best decision in my post stroke life I said yes it was hard work I had to learn how to manage my time and my energy I could design and draw things for 
on the curriculum and do it for hours just fine. But if I was asked to read for 20 minutes, I would need a two hour nap to recover. You know, so I had to learn how to split my time up and take um, advantages of um, assessed um, technology. This allowed me to work longer and be more efficient with my time. Um, but the thing that this job did for me was it gave me a purpose. It made me feel my work meant something. Not only that gave, it was giving me something to do, but gave me something to do that was that I was passionate about. And because of this, do you know what happened? My recovery accelerated my reading, my speech, and my energy um, significantly improved during that time. Instead of um, practicing um, or reading boring things um, um, at my speech therapy, I was reading and um, talking about things I was using for my class. That is why I believe focusing on people's likes, wants, and strengths is so important um, when we are doing plans. Finding work or activities that people like to do is everything. You know, job placements can't be just, well, they are working, so I don't, I did my job. So it has to be meaningful for the person. It, it can be a um, stepping stone to um, reach their ultimate goals, but if a person is unhappy and is not working towards their goals, why would they want to do that work? Another thing is when Wise asked me to do that project, they had no idea my um, my no idea how my stroke had impacted me, but in the year that I worked for the, them, they got to know me pretty well and knew I had a hard that I was a hard worker, and they knew my skills and my and became and because of that, they were willing to take a chance on me. For that, I'm forever grateful. You know. Again, having those um, relationships, those people that know you and see your potential is a key part of person-centered planning. But another key part is having people who um, think big and are willing to take risks. If you think small, you limit yourself or the people that you're supporting. If, if I had went with my worries I and passed on that project. I don't know where I would be today. If it was challenging and I did need support, but because I took that chance, I learned about myself and what I was truly capable of. And that was far beyond what I thought I could do. And what and that project opened up and that project opened up many other opportunities for me um, in the future. And, and none of those things would have been possible if someone didn't take a chance on me and I didn't take a chance on myself. Um, this is a picture um, of me um, wearing a black shirt um, next to Jamie from Wise and my mom. Um, they are both um, Caucasian blonde women wear, um, wearing red shirts. Um, and Jamie is holding a Start Now notebook. Um, my next story is my plan. So, so this is a picture of a stick figure um, and he's scratching his head um, with question marks over floating above it. And there's three arrows pointing out in different directions. Um, when 2015 came um, along, I was in an uncertain part of my life. I had just finished the Start Now program, but didn't know where, what 
where to go next. I had made a lot of progress in my um, recovery, but and I realized that a lot of my disabilities were going to be permanent. I was most concerned about my reading um, and speech and having enough energy to do things. You know, my reading improved, but at this point, I knew it would never be where it was before and would always be um, draining. And frustratingly enough, the more tired I am, the harder it is to get my words out. Um, because of this, I knew that I would no longer be able to go to um, back to be a full-time teacher because um, it's just not something that my body could handle. But I still love teaching. I still loved working with um, students. I still had a lot of skills that was just waiting to be used, but I didn't know where I could do it. I bet you can guess what where I'm going with this. You know, when someone is in a time in their lives when they're they don't know where they are going or don't know what to do or just need ideas, that is the perfect time to have a person center plan. And that is what I did. Um, this is a picture of me during my person center plan. My mom is um, in front of me kind of um, answering some questions. I'm behind her um, contemplating what's being said and uh, my friend is in the background. Um, I actually didn't know what a person center plan was until I had mine. I was told that it was and what it was and what I should expect um, beforehand, but I, it wasn't until I had my plan and, um, that I really truly grasped what it is. Um, because of that, I remember being really nervous. I, I'm a shy person and don't like being in the spotlight. Um, I was um, self-conscious about my aphasia and being able to get my words out. So it took me a while to feel comfortable. Um, when I often, uh, when I observe plans, I often see that um, the person doesn't know and, or, or understand kind of what is going on. You know, having that clear understanding of a person center plan is um, important so that they can fully participate. You know, I find it helpful to really spend time during the, kind of a pre-meeting to make sure everyone understands the person center planning process, um, share, sharing and uh, examples of a person center plan and walking through it with the um, is and showing them the steps really um, helps person kind of grasp what is going to happen and kind of takes out some of that tension. Uh, the, the other thing is um, to kind of make sure that you um, check in with the um, focus person during the plan and kind of make sure they still understand what is happening and are and that they they feel are feeling safe um, uh, and comfortable. You know, at my person center plan, these were several. There were several other things that helped me um, and um, to ease the tension. You know, my mom brought snacks that I. Um, likes to the meeting. And so it kind of felt more like we were hanging out instead of having a meeting. Um, and I had my parents, my sister, and my best friend and his mom, um, and some white staff joined me for my Christmas Center plan. Um, this is a picture of all of us. I am in the middle and with everyone on both sides of me, and we're standing in front of my finished person Center plan which is kind of is on the wall. Um, these were all people my, from my circle of support that I was um, comfortable with and I had handpicked to be there. And I've seen a lot of plans that ha had mostly service providers, you know, people that are paid to be there. The, you know, these are people who can't be important to help implement the plan. But remember, we really want to 
have those people that really know and care about the person to get a robust plan. Now, one thing facilitators can do for those who can't make to the plan is you know gather information um, from them beforehand. You know, this can be done by phone, video chatting, or if it needs to be um, a questionnaire, you know, then you can take that information um, to the plan and share it with the person. I, I think it shows that person that even though that person couldn't be there, they are still they still care and that they want you to, and that you're important, they want you to succeed. Um, and here's another picture of um, all the notes that was um, was recorded on my plan it's on the wall. Um, I think what hits me the most about getting a plan is seeing all these things that I could still do. After my stroke, I faced years and people focusing on what I lost, what I could not, what I could no longer do, how I was broken and how I was, how I needed to be fixed. But for once, I got to see how I'm still great, all the things I can still do and how I am so important. You know, when I, when my plan was over, I felt like I had new ideas for my life and where, um, and that you know, was worth exploring and goals that felt achievable. I felt that I had a future where I could still do things that mattered. Um, and that is important that that is what I want for all people receiving person center plans. What they um, what they come out um, feeling hopeful and encouraged that they can see a future where uh, they can do things they they like do things that they are good at and do things that matter to them. You know, I have felt the pain of loss and the feeling that I wouldn't be able to do anything and it sucks, but I've gotten to see someone fill pages and pages of things that I still can do and it is powerful. And it gave me some so much hope that there was so much more that I can still do um, with my life. Um, this final section is um, finding my superpower. So who am I now? So I learned just this past year that my that many brain surgeries and procedures had done their job and I am now AVM free. Now it's it's weird to think that, you know, I couldn't pick up a sack of potato because um, because it could have caused me to have another stroke, but um, I'm not carrying those things around all the time now. So I am. So I I've been a freelancer where I did um, trainings and consultation. I've helped um, develop more programs and materials around community employment. I've also gotten to teach classes and webinars who you know who would have thought that that shy guy with aphasia would be talking so much um, this is a picture of me teaching a class um, and at one of our transition fairs um, being self-employed was an idea that came out of my person center plan you know, being self-employed was allowed me to manage my time and energy and do work at a pace that I could handle, um, especially when I was recovering. But less than three weeks ago, I started a new job. You know, I accepted a position at WISE and I will be doing a lot of the same work I've been doing while still having some flexibility. But um, now I get to do it under the WISE, as a WISE staff um, um, under their banner. So, so this is, um, this last month has been pretty um, exciting. So one of the other things I had, um, have been doing and will 
continue to be doing um, at, for, for WISE is um, I've been a person center plan facilitator. And um, you know, I, that came straight out of my person center plan. They said, David, I think you would be good at being a facilitator. And I've been involved in person center planning since 2016 and did my first official plan in 2018. Um, when the pandemic hit in 2020, I was one of the first facilitators to do a person center plan online and um, have helped develop um, strategies to help other planners to do um, plans online. Um, and this is a picture of me um, recording a plan on my computer using a drawing pad. Um, when I had my stroke, I always thought, I always treated it like it was my kryptonite. It was my weakness. And this is a picture of kryptonite, which is a green crystal. Um, but my journey, my last, the last 10 years and my experiences had given me a unique perspective that has made me stronger. It has given me a way to connect with and relate to others with disabilities in a way I couldn't before. In my, in some ways, my stroke was my origin story and my experience has become my superpower. You know, I really think people with disabilities have amazing gifts and so much to give to the world. They just might need a person-centered plan to unlock their powers. You know, I really hope this, uh, my story has um, been helpful and has allowed you to see person-centered plan in a different way. And hopefully it will allow you to um, better provide plans for people so that they can find their superpowers. Um, this last picture was um, commissioned by a friend for me and it was drawn by a comic book artist and it and it um it's me and superman and a um bad guy shooting lasers at us um and it's bouncing off of me um the bad guy is asking great scott the molecular rays should have dissolved you both and superman replying don't you know david is a superman So I think we might have a couple of minutes for question A. Um, while we get set up for that, uh, this is my um, business card. Um, there's the WISE logo, um, which is um, two arms shaking hands um, 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 in a way that it forms a W. Um, and this is my information. It's David Murahashi, TA and training manager. And my email is david at gowise.org. Thank you so much for that, David. Um, I, congratulations on your position. It sounds like a very busy month. Thank you. Um, Delia says, David, your story is amazing and inspiring to others in the comments. But I really, I really appreciate it. So if people have questions, you can either unmute and ask your question or you can put it in the chat and we'll, we'll get um, David to answer your questions. One of my questions is, and we can get it started, is, is there anyone you think that wouldn't benefit from a person-centered plan? No. <laughs> right? <think> person-centered <laughs> planning help, can help anyone, you know. Um, no, I don't think it's just something for people with disabilities. Like, I think anyone can benefit from it. Like, if anyone's feeling stuck or, or just needs ideas, like, a person-centered plan can help. People are saying, thank you, David. Appreciate you sharing, appreciate you so much. We are exactly at that point in life, yeah, where I, I'm thinking, um, Key, that you're saying that you have people that might need a person-centered plan. Um, hello, David, and all congrats. Thank you. Ava says, I loved your story. Thanks so much for sharing. I love drawing too. It was so cool to see you put your passion in your work. <laughs> and you know, when I started doing person-centered plans, it was hard because I had to 
do a lot of talking, which is not um, easy for me. And I have been doing a lot of drawing, but drawing is really easy to me. And I was able to, um, and I'm really good with technology. So being able to do plans on a computer really helped me. And so, I know, you know, I can do them on the wall, but like, I get really self-conscious about my spelling and stuff. So on Shame. the computer, you can edit. <laughs> yes. Um, Lily says, do you have suggestions for siblings of people with disabilities and navigating a conversation with their parents about person-centered planning for their sibling? Navigating? Um, just, you know, just having, showing, kind of getting them to know like why it's important and that how helpful it can be, you know. You know, often I see like, we kind of, when someone has siblings, a person with disability has siblings and um, we have ex expectations for people um, who don't have disabilities. Like, oh, we have, you're gonna go to college, you're gonna have jobs, but then we don't have that same um, expectation for the person with a disability. So um, I you know when I do some of the training I do is ha we have the um, siblings and, um, and there's with the person and we kind of do their lessons together. It's like, we're, we're all equals here. You know, we all have ideas and plans for our future. And it do doesn't matter that you have a disability or you don't, you know, we, we're all part of this together. And just talking to the parents that kind of getting that idea in their minds, right? That's important, so. Perfect. Ember says that it seems like the most, the two of the most important elements of a person-centered plan are making sure that the team includes people from a person's life, not just professionals, and also the emphasis on strengths with great visuals. Is this is this right? And what else might be important? Um, yeah, definitely having people like, you know, it's it's kind of hard to do plans when people don't know, like, you know, like the teacher might know, but like professionals, sometimes I've had professionals like, yeah, I've, we've met like last week. Like, how is that really helpful for the plan itself? Like it would be helpful later when, you know, they're trying to find jobs for the person, but, you know, we really need those people that really know them and to actually mm -hmm. make a robust plan. Yeah, and I think this leads into Gail says, I enjoy training and person-centered planning, but the challenge is keeping parties engaged for the many meetings. What type of time management has worked for you? Um, you know, sometimes breaking up sessions is, is the way to go, you know, and sometimes it's, it's it helps the person because sometimes we have clients that can't keep it their attention for very long. So having to break up things and make it, um, allowing them to be part of it. And, and instead of doing it all in one day, break it up into different sections and stuff. Um, it's, it's really about the person. So whatever they need, um, we have to accommodate for so. Perfect. Well, we appreciate you again, David, for being here and answering questions and doing your training and hearing your story. Um, I also want to encourage everyone to complete the survey, which will um, pop up right after um, this webinar closes. So you'll receive a pop up for a survey. So please take that survey. Um, David and I are both on the board of our state APSI chapters. I'm, I'm the co-president of Arizona APSI and David is on the Washington State APSI. And this is the Association of People Supporting Employment First or people obtaining um, work within their communities. And I just wanna mention that if you're interested, please go check our website out. It's at azapsi.org. We have our annual meeting and a mini conference coming up October 4th at 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. PM where we're going to have um, some great speakers. So save the date for that. And we hope that people um, will kind of get to know what, what we're all about and join us in getting people with disabilities employed. Um, also, yeah, right, David? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and our Washington APSI and Oregon APSI does a, um, we put a, a form together each year and we call it collaborate. So our form this year is in September and we're going to be in Spokane, Washington. So if you're interested, in hearing, I'll be one of the presenters. So if you're interested in hearing me again, um, we'll be September 19th through the 22nd. And um, our website is 
Pacific North, let's see, P N W E F Pacific Northwest Employment Forum dot org. So P N E F. <laughs> so the last episode, I guess, or webinar of this series is happening September 8th, and it's why employment first must be a priority in Arizona. It's a great walk into National Employment Disability Awareness Month, which is October. So we hope that you'll join us for that and look for that and get registered for that. So thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you. And please remember to take our survey.